Welcome everyone to uh, Stanford University Center for International Security and Cooperation uh, and our weekly research seminar. Uh, my name is Harold Trincunas. I'm the Deputy Director of the Center. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome today our guest speaker, uh, Austin uh, Cooper, who is a pre-doctoral researcher here at uh, Stanford CSAC, also a PhD candidate in the History and Sociology of Science at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and we're very happy uh, that in the fall, Austin will be joining the nuclear knowledges team at Sciences Po Paris with support from the Fulbright Hayes Doctoral Dissertation Research Abroad Program. Um, uh, we're looking forward to hearing from Austin on his research uh, between the Cold War arms race and African decolonization, fallout risks from French nuclear weapon tests in Algeria, 1960 to 1966. Uh, uh, I'll turn this over to Austin in a moment, uh, but just as a reminder, there will be a, uh, uh, about 25, 30 minutes for Q&A uh, towards the end of uh, today's seminar. I'll be managing the Q&A. Please feel free at any time to enter uh, questions uh, you might have for um, Austin in the Q&A function in um, uh, uh, Zoom. So without much further ado, uh, Austin, over to you. On February 13th, 1960, a mushroom cloud soared above the Algerian Sahara. Spectacular proof that France had developed and detonated an atomic bomb. This made France the fourth country to join the nuclear arms race, following Atlantic allies in the United States and United Kingdom, as well as Cold War rivals in the Soviet Union. The French bomb loomed too, over the struggle for decolonization in Africa, in the Arab world, in Asia, and other parts of the globe. France's desert test site occupied contested territory claimed by the Algerian revolutionaries leading the Algerian war for independence, which, waged from, which raged from 1954 to 1962, as well as by Moroccan nationalists waging an irredentist campaign for Maghrebi sovereignty. Over these territorial claims and other objections, French nuclear planners continued to use the Algerian Sahara for weapons development until 1966, sparking an international controversy that reverberated across North Africa and beyond. The problem of radioactive debris known as fallout proved central to wide resistance to the French nuclear explosions, linking diplomatic popular and scientific concerns. A complete technical success, one French general described his country's first nuclear blast in a secret telegram from his on-site post, as much in terms of the construction and detonation of the device as the measurements taken of all sorts. He declined to report the yield, preferring to keep that secret for now, but he confirmed that the device had exploded on top of and vaporized a metal tower a common method for US shots in the Nevada desert during the 1950s. The French general reported large metal particles scattered around ground zero, but otherwise boasted a relatively clean explosion, one that left no crater behind and kicked up only a minimal amount of sand in his words. He based this enthusiastic assessment on reports from airplanes carrying detection devices that flew over the area in the wake of the blast. The fallout question surfaced immediately. In his secret telegram, the French general admitted that fallout from the explosion had created a contaminated zone in the shape of a cigar, no longer than 300 kilometers long and 30 kilometers wide, stretching east southeast from ground zero. He estimated that a person would receive a radiation dosage of approximately one rentgen if they stayed in this area and never left during the course of a year. Of course, he continued, this zone extends entirely over desert territory, implying there was no reason to worry about human exposure. Beyond that narrow strip of irradiated sand, the French general insisted, the fallout is too light for us to be able to talk about contamination. Like many military, diplomatic, and scientific representatives of nuclear weapons states, not limited to France, he suggested that radioactive fallout posed no risk to human health or the environment, unless the radiation dosage surpassed a certain threshold. 
The science was less definitive, however, and there were other ways of understanding radiation risk that proved key to the Sahara controversy and fallout politics more broadly. The nuclear explosion took place roughly 60 miles southwest of the military base that French engineers built adjacent to the desert town of Regan. They had recruited roughly 1,500 Algerian laborers from nearby oases to advance the construction work during the late 1950s. At the same time, French officials were using the line that they had picked in an empty and uninhabited part of the Sahara for bomb development in an attempt to deflect international criticism of France's nuclear weapons program and its entanglements with the last remnants of France's colonial empire. The secret telegram from the French general implicitly acknowledged some human presence in the region, boasting no incidents and zero damage to the oasis town of Regan or the adjacent base. He also admitted that fallout contaminated the highways that French engineers had carved through the Algerian desert. One of these reopened only on the condition that French troops administer radiation checks to vehicles traversing the contaminated zone. French nuclear planners dubbed their first blast Gervoise Bleu, or Blue Gerboa, in inaug inaugurating a color-coded series of four atmospheric explosions at the Regan site, all named bizarrely after the desert rodent. White Gerboa followed in April 1960, Red Gerboa in December 1960, and Green Gerboa in April 1961. The naming protocol changed when France moved its nuclear weapons program to a second Algerian site underneath the, the Saharan mountains known as the Hogar Massif. Each of the 13 underground detonations that France conducted in Algeria through 1966 corresponded to a dif different gemstone, for example, emerald, amethyst, topaz, etc. France relinquished control of its two Saharan test sites to Algeria's independent government in 1967 and moved its weapons testing program to French Polynesia. One last point on the desert rodent. Created by the French screen screenwriter Jean-Francois Alain and distributed by the US streaming service Netflix, the television series A Very Secret Service put the atmospheric explosions odd code names at the center of its characteristic farce. In one episode released in 2018, a fictional agent of the French intelligence services named Jacquard enlists his Algerian fixer Mokhtar to help transport a nuclear device to the test site near Regan for Green Gerboa. The scene opens on Mokhtar and the white suited Frenchman he calls C.D. Jacqui traipsing with flashlights around a dark hangar. Lifting a comically large missile out of its packing crate, Mukhtar complains to Sidi Jaki, the Gerboa is not green, but it is heavy. The French spy responds blithely, Gerboa is a code name, it's not a rodent. The two shuffle the missile out of the hangar, strap it to the top of a Citroën de chevaux, and Mukhtar hops in the driver's seat for a road trip into the desert. So far, the French archives have not provided a better explanation for the bomb's namesake. Radioactive fallout from French nuclear explosions in Algeria animated an international controversy at the intersection of the Cold War arms race and African decolonization. The question that the French general had set aside about the yield generated by Gervois Bleu in February 1960 offers a valuable lens. U.S. surveillance instruments based in Morocco registered 79 kilotons, a result that, quote, surprised and interested the American technicians, as one French diplomat posted in Washington reported proudly. This signaled more than five times the force of the U.S. bomb that had leveled Hiroshima at the end of the Second World War, but in order of magnitude less than the thermonuclear weapons tested, according to U.S. government lingo, in the Marshall Islands during the 1950s with lasting health and environmental consequences. Still, the French diplomat in Washington surmised that scientific data from military technologies located in Morocco had forced US nuclear experts to take the French bomb seriously. He complained, however, that the highest levels of the US government were not showing their French allies the respect they had earned in the Algerian Sahara. <clears throat> 
hearing silence from the White House and only a brief communique from the State Department, the French, the French diplomat concluded, quote, the United States has welcomed France coldly into the atomic club. The French diplomat in Washington stressed the US angle on this story more than the Moroccan one, but the French blast met real blowback in North Africa. It is likely that the US instruments were installed at one of several US air bases in Morocco on territory that France had granted during the last years of the French protectorate and that the US military had retained through Moroccan independence in 1956. US forces stored nuclear weapons at these facilities. And in 1958, one nuclear armed bomber caught fire on the runway at Sidi Sliman Air Base, prompting evacuation and the surrounding area in Morocco put on alert. US officials tried to keep the nukes a secret, perhaps difficult in the wake of the Sidi Sliman accident, but the Moroccans in any case took the bases as quote, an affront to their newly acquired independence and they considered them as indicating approval of colonialism, as one US Air Force history put it in 1958. Nationalist resistance had a hand in the US decision to close all Moroccan bases by 1963, though not before detecting the French atmospheric blast in 1960. The French blasts across Morocco's hard-won border with Algeria became another target for the politics of Moroccan nationalism and its ties to anti-colonial movements with anti-nuclear dimensions stretching across Africa throughout the Arab and Islamic world and even further into the Indian subcontinent, East Asia and the Pacific. In terms of the Cold War, Saharan blasts mattered for military strategy, but only to a certain extent. During the 1950s, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization had premised the defense of Western Europe on a nuclear umbrella guaranteed by US and UK weapons. Nuclear capabilities appeared as the threshold for a country like France to have some influence over NATO's military posture. This was one reason why French President Charles de Gaulle championed an independent nuclear deterrent for his country, famously known as the Force de Frappe. But even de Gaulle and his scientific and military advisors realized that nuclear explosions in the Algerian desert could not on their own produce a deterrent effect. France lacked nuclear credibility through the early 1970s, as Benoit Pelopidas and Sébastien Philippe have documented, largely due to the disappointing performance of the French Mirage 4 nuclear bomber, which foreign observers did not take seriously as a delivery system. Still, Saharan fallout had immense Cold War implications. Gerboise Bleu appeared to interrupt a testing moratorium agreed in 1958 by the United States, United Kingdom, and Soviet Union, the world's first three nuclear powers. France had never consented to these terms, but US and UK officials worried that their French allies' first Saharan explosion could derail ongoing negotiations towards some sort of test ban. The partial test ban treaty prohibiting nuclear explosions in the atmosphere, underwater, and in outer space would not come into effect until 1963, and France refused to sign it in any case. But the close attention that US and UK officials paid to Saharan fallout needs to be seen in the context of international negotiations about weapons testing. Notwithstanding the fact that France had received little help developing its bomb, Washington and London worried that France's nuclear weapons program would appear as an extension of their own, and Soviet propaganda clearly tried to paint that picture. US and UK diplomats, moreover, saw popular opposition to the French blasts mounting across Africa and worried too that Saharan fallout could sour African attitudes towards the West, opening the door to communist influence on the continent. The nuclear powers were far from the only players in this arena either. Post-colonial leaders seized the Sahara issue in their efforts to develop a third path for international relations and navigate away from the Cold War's bipolar standoff. 
at Morocco's request made in the wake of direct appeals to the French government that really didn't go anywhere, the first committee of the United Nations General Assembly discussed the question of French nuclear tests in the Sahara from November 13 to November, from November 4 to November 13 in 1959. These 10 days of debate garnered broad support for a Moroccan drafted resolution denouncing French plans for desert explosions, which passed the first committee and the General Assembly, as historian Roxanne Panchassi has observed. Participants in the debate and UN observers saw a new coalition of independent African and Asian states forged in processes of decolonization and Cold War realignment, the so-called Afro-Asian bloc, consolidating behind the resolution. This coalition traced its roots and its firm stance against weapons testing to the Bandung Conference that brought together post-colonial leaders from Africa and Asia in Indonesia in 1955, as well as subsequent meetings held in the Bandung spirit across Africa during the late 1950s. Beyond Morocco's neighbors in Tunisia and Libya, the Afro-Asian group included independent African states south of the Sahara, like Ghana and Guinea, Arab representatives from Iraq and Saudi Arabia, as well as Asian leaders in India and Indonesia. When French delegate Jules Mouk and some of his nuclear armed allies treated the UN session as an opportunity to reassure the international community of what Mouk called the innocuousness of French plans to detonate nuclear devices in the Algerian Sahara, most African and Asian delegations stood up in protest. Notable exceptions included settler states in South Africa and Israel. At the UN, post-colonial leaders seized the problem of radiation risk to force an aspiring nuclear power and declining colonial empire to grapple publicly with the consequences of nuclear explosions. The Afro-Asian bloc united at once against France's ruthless efforts to retain control of Algeria and around a cautious approach to fallout exposure, one that underscored the absence of scientific consensus on radiation risks and the disproportionate exposure to this radioactive debris forced on African and Asian populations. The UN session revealed one register where Saharan blasts intersected with the so-called fallout debate, and it illuminated in a nuclear fashion how concerns about violence, harm, risk, and sovereignty were unfolding in Africa at the turn of the 1960s. African leaders and their Asian allies compared French nuclear explosions in the Sahara to the US atomic bombing of Hiroshima in 1945 and the US thermonuclear blast codenamed Castle Bravo that poisoned the Marshall Islands, their indigenous people, and the crew of a Japanese fishing boat trawling for tuna in 1954. French diplomats, of course, refused these comparisons and pointed instead to atmospheric explosions previously conducted in arid territories cast as perfectly suited for this purpose. Since the US testing program in the Nevada desert and the Soviet one in the steppes of Kazakhstan had not yet proven harmful, so the French argument went, there should be no cause for concern about French tests in an even emptier, more vast and more remote, barely populated desert, the Algerian Sahara. This line of reasoning echoed colonialist tropes and ignored contemporaneous objections on health grounds to the US testing program at least, to say nothing of what we know today about what happened in Nevada and in Kazakhstan. Another view of Gerbois Bleu, this one from the personal archives of French anthropologist, politician, and colonial official Jacques Sustel. Sustel became governor general in Algeria during the first years of the Algerian War, served as minister of the Sahara, overseas territories, and atomic energy during 1959 and 1960. Then he swiftly broke with de Gaulle's support for Algerian independence and sympathized with French terrorists who turned to bombings and assassinations in an attempt to disrupt the Algeria, to disrupt the decolonization process 
and, quote, keep Algeria French. The photograph depicts delegates of the French community present at Regan the day of the explosion of the first French atomic bomb alongside French military officials. The French community proved a short-lived attempt to reorganize France's colonial empire into an inequitable federation, one that delegated few powers of self-government to its African members. Some of de Gaulle's nuclear propaganda described the Algerian blasts as proof of the community's bomb, and the photo from Soustel's papers reflects that strategy. Pictured at the Saharan test site were representatives from Upper Volta, now Burkina Faso, Côte d'Ivoire, Gabon, Dahomey, now Benin, Congo Brazzaville, Mali, Chad, and Madagascar. Literally, though perhaps not more, the photograph means to show that parts of Africa stood behind French weapons development in the Algerian Sahara. This mattered especially because Saharan explosions drew fierce resistance from Francophone, Arabophone, and Anglophone parts of Africa. The sharpest opponents included the independent governments of King Mohammed V in Morocco, Ahmed Sekou Touré in Guinea, and Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana. In December 1959, a convoy of Land Rovers and supply trucks carried a group of African independence fighters African-American civil rights leaders and European peace activists known as the Sahara protest team. The group received personal and financial support from the highest levels of Nkrumah's government, namely his finance minister who spearheaded the fundraising campaign. French officers stopped the convoy shortly after it crossed Ghana's border with Upper Volta, one of the territories in the French community. Some of the members of the, Sahara, of the Sahara protest team turned back immediately, but a smaller contingent camped near the border and attempted several more crossings. What united the Sahara protest team and its backers in the Ghanaian government was shared opposition to nuclear imperialism, as they put it. This memorable phrase indexed, indexed several aspects of French weapons development in Algeria the use of colonized and contested land for nuclear explosions, the overlap between the struggle for African decolonization and the Cold War arms race, and the likelihood that radioactive fallout from French blasts in the Sahara would cross the borders of independent African states and violate their hard-won sovereignty. Popular demonstrations against the French bomb raged across many of the continent's political, cultural, linguistic, and regional divides. As Gabrielle Hecht has observed in her work on uranium mining in Gabon, attention to the French blasts lessened around the equator. But anti-apartheid leaders in South Africa, including the African National Congress, raised their voices against the French bomb as part of their struggle for black liberation. These widespread protests imagined a much larger blast zone than the relatively small area near Regan in Algeria that French nuclear planners would cordon off for their atmospheric explosions. Rallies and strikes unfolded from Cairo in the east to Tangier in the north to Monrovia in the west and to Lagos in the south. Outside these cities, unrest spread through rural areas. The scale of these demonstrations from a few dozen protesters to 100,000 ranged as widely as the participants, sometimes government officials and well-known activists led parades, but the organizers often came from associations of workers, veterans, and students. Demonstrations by mothers groups brought women into the fold. What one US diplomat posted in Rabat described as radiation atrocity stories at once motivated and documented these popular protests. Spreading through newspapers, radio, and word of mouth on all sides of the Sahara Desert were accounts alleging terrible effects from the French explosions, entire villages destroyed overnight, mass sterilization of people and livestock, epidemics caused by radioactive germs. Whether or not the facts checked out, many types of observers had to take these, had to take these stories seriously. <laughs> 
As hard as French officials tried to deny the overlap, fallout from Saharan explosions enmeshed the Cold War arms race with the politics of African decolonization. French nuclear explosions in the Sahara Desert proved inextricable from the Algerian War for Independence, the wider history of colonialism in Africa by French and other Western nations, and the many changes that the struggle for African decolonization and superpower tussles over spheres of influence brought to the, co to the continent. This helps to explain why France's nuclear allies paid such close attention to the French nuclear weapons program, including fallout intensity, trajectories, and risks. For their part, independent African states mounted a strong challenge to French use of the desert for bomb development, including diplomatic interventions, cultivation of popular opposition, and support for scientific efforts to measure the presence of Saharan fallout on their sovereign territory and assess radiation effects. Interest convergence allowed some cooperation in the form of scientific partnerships, as historian Abina Davaseo Asare has observed. North Atlantic states possessing nuclear weapons and nuclear reactors dispatched technical experts to assist with African fallout measurements. Teams of British and Nigerian scientists on the one hand and Canadian and Ghanaian ones on the other collaborated to produce maps visualizing the, tra the trajectory that the radioactive cloud produced by Gerboise Bleu took from Regan across the continent. Represented in this way, Saharan fallout materially traced France's presence in Africa at a moment when revolutionaries, activists, diplomats, and scientists were insisting that this was not where France belonged. With that, I'm happy to take uh, questions and look forward to continuing this conversation uh, with you. So uh, over to you, Harold, thank you. Thank you, Austin. And uh, just as a reminder to everyone, uh, please go ahead and enter any questions you might have in the Q&A function of uh, Zoom. Um, and uh, we have a first question from uh, Karthika uh, Sisakumar. Um, she says, um, your talk showed admirably how France and its former territories in Africa were linked by nuclear colonialism. Can you find elements of post-colonial resentment in the relationship between the US and France, such as the desire to catch up with technological achievements? Um. The remnants, the debris, the residues of uh, nuclear imperialism in Africa have certainly lingered, yes. Um, this is uh, obviously a, a phenomenon. It's a, it's a problem that uh, France is not the only nuclear power to have to grapple with. So um, as I mentioned, um, the United States conducted enormous atmospheric nuclear explosions in the Marshall Islands, um, leaving uh, uh, environmental contamination and causing um, health effects. So um, in this way, the United States has had to grapple with um, its own legacies of its own sort of um, history of nuclear imperialism. Uh, one, so lots of this is this has manifested in lots of ways. One way that this is manifested is is lawsuits. There's a there's an entire 20th century history of of lawsuits brought by uh, Marshall Islanders against the United States. Uh, more recently, the United States has um, created compensation programs um, for uh, Marshall Islanders. Um, there are several of these, um, as, as and also. Um, the, the US has extended uh, health benefits to Marshall Islanders, um, something that was interrupted. And there was a really interesting article in Politico where um, one of the COVID relief packages, in fact, restored um, the, the Marshallese, uh, the, the health benefits for the Marshallese. So again, that's one example. Another, another point in, in the US context has to do with the desert Southwest and, and Nevada. Um, the Four Corners region is home to many uh, indigenous nations, tribal nations in the United States, 
And um, in addition to the nuclear weapons testing, this is where um, a lot of the uranium fueling the US nuclear program, both civil and military has come from. So um, there is a, a US program um, that uh, has been set up to provide compensation um, for nuclear weapons test, testing victims, uh, uranium miners, um, et cetera. That sort of came to a head, these, these programs that I'm talking about in the US context um, came, to head, came to a head around, around 1990. There was an important settlement with the Marshall Islands, I believe in 89, and the, the Southwest program was settled, was created in, in, in 1990. France has created its own compensation program um, that Algerians and Polynesians are both eligible to submit applications for. This lagged behind the US program by uh, several decades, beginning only in 2010. Um, it would be an interesting uh, ethnographic and archival study to see if the French program was inspired perhaps by US efforts to grapple with uh, nuclear imperialism in the Marshall Islands and um, internal nuclear colonialism in the desert Southwest. I, I can't say for sure, um, but there are resonances and, and similarities and there are still issues with this program. So recent reports, um, by French journalists and Algerian journalists have documented that um, Algerian uh, survivors of the, the French tests have um, really struggled to, to, to get their claims heard. Um, and um, there's, there's, there's more to say about this, but it's, it's an ongoing realm of contestation at sort of political and scientific um, levels that, that's um, largely playing out in, in the field of the, the compensation program and environmental remediation. Um, but that appears to be a little bit less of an issue in the in the Saharan context. Thank you. Great. Um, I'm going to go to a question from one of our fellows now. We have a tradition of CSAC of letting our, our pre and postdoctoral fellows ask some of the first questions. Uh, so Ryan Musto says, um, fantastic presentation, Austin, with truly stunning visuals. You mentioned that the U.S. worried that the first French test would sour African attitudes towards the West and open the continent to communist influence. Did France ever produce an assessment before its first test of that potential outcome? And were there dissident voices within the French government that warned against the fallout politics of a test? Hi, Ryan. Um, as usual, awesome question. Um, hard to answer because of um, declassification and secrecy, um, de de limits to declassification and a strict tradition of secrecy pertaining to French nuclear um, materials and, and affairs. Most of my sources for my dissertation pro uh, project with some important exceptions come from the French diplomatic archives. The French military archives are extremely difficult to access. The only thing I've been able to get from there are the construction reports where I got the, the photo from. Um, and then of course you saw the Soustelle papers and there are a couple other sort of uh, high ranking French officials um, who um, have uh, um, made those their papers available from that period. Um, was there a systematic assessment within the French government of fallout politics? Um, my response would be no. Um, I don't, for two reasons. One, um, the French, the official French line that uh, the, the delegate to the UN, Jules Mouc, um, uh, offered, was that France was extremely confident that the fallout would remain um, in unpopulated parts of the Algerian Sahara. Um, I've traced this claim through the French diplomatic archives, looking at the documents that um, Mouk based his, his, uh, his argument on, their, their meteorological reports from the French army and the French uh, Atomic Energy Commission, um, they're pretty, they're pretty slim. Uh, they're drawing on just a handful of sources. And my assessment would be that, you know, neither Mook nor sort of the, the folks at the French army or the CEA were taking this extremely seriously. I think that they were pretty confident that 
the the Sahara was huge and pretty vast and it just wasn't a big deal. I mean, that's the argument that they were trying to capture with the images comparing sort of the Sahara to Nevada and, uh, and Kazakhstan. On the other hand, there were dissident voices. Um, I've only come across a couple um, and I'm not sure based on my access to see declassified documents that I can identify them by name. Um, it's really been a bit of a rigmarole to get a hold of, of these papers, but what I will say is that France wanted to, there were voices within the highest levels of the French atomic energy establishment that wanted to proceed immediately with underground tests in the Sahara. In other words, there were highly influential people who would have preferred that France only ever test underground in Algeria. And the reason that um, they didn't do it was they didn't have the technical capacity. They appealed to the United States for assistance. There were delegations of French technical experts to the United States, to Los Alamos, et cetera, to try to learn how to do at underground testing. And it just wasn't, um, it wasn't feasible by the time that France, that the, that the French sort of military and political teams uh, wanted to go ahead with the, with the explosions. So um, that's a story that, that I want to tell and that I want to represent. And I think the way that I'm going to get at it is um, when I talk about um, how and why France shifted to underground testing in Algeria. Um, in the later part of 1961, but thanks, Ryan. Thanks, uh, uh, Austin. Uh, let's go now to a question from Bruce Goodwin. Uh, he asks, at what point in time did the nuclear hostility between the US and France abate? The US and French weapons programs enjoy a good relationship today. When and how did this evolve from hostility? Yeah. Um, certainly, um, the the U.S. Uh, Congress prevented um, the technical agencies from sharing information with the French with the French during the early years of the um, nuclear of France's nuclear development in the 40s and 50s in particular. What I will say is that by the turn of the 60s, in particular 61, 62, um, the French were soliciting help from the Americans. I have letters from the French Atomic Energy, one of the French Atomic Energy Commission directors, Francis Perrin, uh, appealing to the sort of scientific and technical advisors on Lyndon Baines Johnson's staff, um, asking for help uh, running underground tests. So it's, it's pretty clear to me that by, this, by, the, by the early 60s, after France had joined the Atomic Club as, as, as um, um, that French diplomat in Washington put it, that um, the, the two countries had, had begun collaborating at least uh, at a limited extent. Um, there were also some tensions, for example, when France moved its program to um, French Polynesia. The US um, had some oceanographic research going on in that part of the South Pacific. Um, and there was also some space race stuff. The, 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 there were some complications with NASA and there was a little bit of a scientific tussle um, between the French nuclear weapons program and the US space program over who would get to use um, that part of the, the, the Pacific because uh, France uh, was, was going to revoke the, the license that they had given to the US space program um, after the, the, the testing site went online. So what I'd say is that, you know, you start to I've start to see some see some cooperation in the middle of this in the sort of early to mid part of the 60s. Um, but I, I can't say uh, exactly. Um, I, I can't I can't say exactly what the scope and scale of that cooperation was. But thanks very much for that question. Hey, uh, from Jonathan Hunt. How did French nuclear testing and the regional protest and UN diplomacy relative to it interact with elite African debates about Pan-Africanism in different projects of political union? Wonderful question, yeah. Um, um, I would say that the, um, 
opposition to the to the French nuclear weapons program was was more of to the French nuclear testing in Algeria was was more of a unifying factor um, than a, than a polarizing one for elite African um, politicians. Uh, obviously, sort of the the questions about the the French community and um, the 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 voices of elite francophone African politicians who, uh, at least for a time, considered allying themselves with France's nuclear policy is something to to take into account. And it's a, it's a it's a difficult that's a difficult problem to study, in my opinion. And and it's something that I, I want to learn more about. Um, but I, I can at least say that. Um, one, one of the things that the, that the French bomb did was, um, in West Africa at least, it created some um, convergences between uh, different kinds of uh, approaches to African decolonization. For example, um, uh, uh, Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana and um, um, uh, Abu Bakr Tafawa Balewa in Nigeria um, were um, sort of political rivals. They had very different approaches to dealing with uh, the, 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 the British government during the decolonization process. And yet by the time that Nigeria became independent in 1960, uh, the second half, Nigeria followed um, uh, Nkrumah in taking an extremely um, uh, firm stance against French weapons testing like Nkrumah uh, Balewa broke diplomatic relations with France in, in 1960, um, sending uh, the, 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 the French ambassador, expelling the French ambassador from Lagos. And, and the Nigerian uh, diplomatic rupture uh, lasted until uh, the, the early 1970s throughout de Gaulle's, de Gaulle's tenure as president. Um, and, and the other thing that I mentioned is, you know, um, the, the South African nationalists saw opposition to the to the French nuclear weapons testing as an important part of the struggle for for black and African liberation. And the other thing is that in Arab Africa, sort of the the opposition to the French weapons tests was was portrayed as part of sort of um, uh, a, a politics of Maghrebi unity and even a broader politics of pan African unity. So what I'd say is the fallout problem uh, the, the fall, the sort of the, the the fallout from the French blasts, it created sort of a material um, point of unity for all sorts of African uh, political projects during decolonization, um, and and I don't want to sort of um, evacuate sort of the tensions and disagreements among these leaders, but but I do want to I do, I would make the argument that in general. Um, it, it provided a, a unifying force, although one that was multivalent and seized by different actors and created sort of different um, tensions and conflicts too. Thanks for that question. Thanks, Austin. Um, Martha Crenshaw asks, um, if you could talk a little bit about the effect of the French testing program on the Algerian independence negotiations. Um, wonderful question, yes. Um, when the um, the so the, the the Algerian independence negotiations um, were ongoing um, at Evian, Switzerland, um, during the, the the period that France was detonating um, nuclear weapons in the Algerian atmosphere in the in the atmosphere above the Algerian Sahara, and. Um, the, there were actually two phases of the Evian talks because um, in the summer of 1961, the first round of talks at Evian broke down and the, um, the, the, the explosions in the Sahara were one reason why. So, so the nuclear issue was, was front and center during the Evian negotiations. It was a point of contention between the French and the Algerians. Um, and it was one, but not the only reason why, one of many reasons why they, they walked away from the, from the tables um, in, in the summer of 61. The French wanted to retain um, its, uh, their, uh, their test sites in the Sahara, and the Algerians cast the, the weapons program as a violation of um, Algerian sovereignty. And this was in the context of a lot of other debates about what to do with the Sahara. Um, but um, 
the when 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 the talks broke down, um, secret negotiations resumed, and the U.S. ambassador to Tunisia was France's back channel. And um, in the context of those secret negotiations and the and the talks that resumed in the fall of '61. Um, the French and the Algerians came to a nuclear compromise. And what they decided was um, France would get a five-year lease to the sites. Um, and uh, uh, in 19, by 1967, they would have to pack up and, and leave. Um, so it, it wasn't, that was the letter of the law, um, you know, the, the, the treaty, the Avion Accords. But it was a little bit more complicated than that um, for, for a couple of reasons. One was the, the treaty was, um, the, the, the language in the treaty was pretty vague. So the, the Evian Accords didn't specify terms of use. Um, technically, France could have continued atmospheric explosions um, in the Sahara, but the French, French diplomats um, encouraged the, the nuclear um, program to move underground ASAP because they were worried about uh, diplomatic blowback from the Algerians and sort of Algeria's allies in, and neighbors in Africa. So um, after Algerian independence, also um, the, the nuclear issue continued to flare. Algeria's first president, um, Ahmed Ben Bala, he um, sort of raised a public a, a public fuss about the 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 explosions um, but he he didn't um, try to sort of uh, force France to, to stop the the underground pr program um, uh, directly uh, just sort of making this uh, an issue because um, you know it was seen maintaining uh, a hard line against the French was I believe important for, for his legitimacy and the legitimacy of, of the Algerian state. So to sum that up, I'd say um, it became crucial for the negotiations. They found a compromise. And then uh, during the first years of Algerian independence, the, the issue sort of flared a little bit, but it, it wasn't um, an, an enormous, uh, uh, it wasn't an insurmountable challenge. Thank you, Austin. I'm actually gonna skip to a question by, um, a PhD candidate in the history department at Stanford, who's actually writing a dissertation on decolonization in Algeria, because I think it's related to the question uh, you were just addressing. He, um, Brooke Durham asks um, about the UN conferences on the French nuclear tests, and whether you have any, any evidence of the FLN using this attention to uh, support their own anti-colonial ends during the Algerian war, and you briefly touched on this, but any evidence of Algerian presidents Ben Bella or Boumediene making speeches about these tests or the fallout associated with them? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, the, the, the perspective of the FLN and the GPRA, um, Algeria's um, sort of provisional government um, that, that sort of represented the Algerian nationalists during the war um, have been the hardest perspectives, some of the hardest perspectives for me to access. Um, I had every intention of going to Algiers and trying to work with GPRA records. Um, that's hard to begin with. Uh, COVID made that impossible for now and probably for the dissertation phase of this project. I have a couple of French reports um, French diplomatic reports, French military intelligence reports indicating that yes, the Algerians, the FLN and the GPRA issued communiques. They very clearly linked this to um, the, the independence struggle. I don't, I can't say about the, the UN. I, I imagine yes, because of what was going on at the time contextually, the efforts that other historians like Matthew Connolly and Jeffrey James Byrne and Jennifer Johnson have documented by the Algerians to try to drum up support among their African and Asian allies at the UN for the Algerian independence struggle. Um, and as I was mentioning, uh, yes, Ben Bala um, did, did seize this issue um, uh, sort of to bolster his legitimacy um, after Algerian independence. Can't say um, I know about sort of how Boumediene handled this uh, from 65 forward. Um, but 
it, I, I, I'm fascinated by that angle too. And I would love to get a hold of the, of the FLN GPRA records and see what they were doing on the nuclear diplomacy side. Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, going now to a question from Jill Hazelton. Uh, Jill's interested in hearing more about the cooperation between African leaders and activists and US civil rights activists, as well as between um, African leaders and activists and colonial and post-colonial movements and states around the world uh, around this issue. Thanks, Jill. Um, there's great literature to read on the cooperation between um, the, the anti-nuclear cooperation between African uh, independence advocates and African-American civil rights leaders. Um, I'd invite you to check out Vincent and Tondi's book, um, as well as Gene Allman's article. Um, both of these look at the Sahara protest team that I mentioned. Vincent and Tondi does a deep dive on Bayard Rustin, um, and, and, and um, it, it's a fascinating literature. Um, uh, on the sort of connections to broader post-colonial and colonial um, and anti-colonial movements, um, I think that the, the, the um, angle that I've found most striking is um, in the diplomatic arena, in particular, um, the, the, the bridges that African diplomats from, for example, Liberia built um, between sort of what happened to the Marshallese and the, the Japanese fishermen uh, after Castle Bravo and what could happen to the Algerians and sort of their African neighbors, um, depending on sort of how the French test went at Brigand. And then on the flip side, you know, the some of the Asian post-colonial statesmen, they seized the, the Sahara issue and, and what sort of France had planned for Africa as a way to um, advocate for, um, you know, uh, sort of the what they saw as racial discrimination in the sighting of U.S. and U.K. weapons tests in the Pacific and and in Asia. Um, so th there's 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 some good literature to 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 read there to look at there. Um, um, but yeah, I, I would say that the the I've I've traced the African Asian cooperation mainly in a diplomatic register. Thanks. Um, we're starting to run out of time, so I'm going to have to skip around and um, grouping questions here because they're related. So from Jaida Sarkar, uh, who says, terrific project, Austin. Um, could you discuss how race and radioactivity are entangled in your research in the context of nuclear Franca-Frique? Um, yeah, absolutely. The, the argument that I would like to develop is that radiation exposure became another aspect of racialization in the colonial and post-colonial context. And um, I like this angle because I think drawing on what I was saying to Jill, it, it, it brings together a lot of contexts, the, the American Southwest, the Pacific, Asia and Africa. Um, so in terms of thinking about sort of what, what racialization is and, and how it operates and what it does. I think that introducing radiation exposure as, as a category um, in the construction of these social hierarchies, social, political, diplomatic hierarchies um, is, is one of the interventions that I wanna make here. And I wanna be clear, like that's, it's not just me saying it, that's what my actors, that's what the, the African and Asian opponents of Saharan testing were arguing um, at the turn of the 60s, they were arguing that um, what France was doing in the Sahara was not only consistent with a history of colonial exploitation, but the but the radio the, the 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 radiation exposure was a new and um, uh, subversive and pernicious form of racial of of racial discrimination, precisely because, in many cases it's extremely difficult to measure and it's an extremely difficult to detect. And, and there's a certain degree of scientific expertise that becomes, if not necessary, relevant um, to, to sort of sussing out these debates and 
um, sort of choosing sides. So that's one of the, the, the angles that I'm trying to sharpen with this project is the relationship between radiation exposure and racialization. Thanks. Um, I'm going to bring in another question from one of our CSAC fellows, Michelle Spector. Um, and then I'll try to squeeze in one more after that if we still have time. So um, Michelle says, thanks, Austin, for this fascinating perspective. Could you expand a bit more on the different kinds of scientific instruments, mapping, and techniques used by different teams to me measure the amount of fallout resulting from the French nuclear weapons testing? Which, if any of these measurements were accepted as credible, by whom, in Algeria, around the world? And how did this factor into the politics of decolonization and efforts for Algerian independence? Did France ever back away from claims that the fallout was minimal or not impactful? Hi, Michelle. Um, awesome question. Uh, the answer is not until 2010. Uh, I don't think that France backed away from, from those claims when they, they started the compensation program. Um, and, and sort of the, the, I need to do some more work on the compensation program and to think about how much of a, how much admission of guilt was implic is implicated in awarding people compensation. But um, what I can say is that um, in the 60s, when African, North American, and European scientists were collaborating to um, assess fallout levels in, in West Africa and North Africa, um, beyond the immediate test site, which only sort of the, the French military would have had access to anyways, so in sort of these West African territories and in North African, independent North African states, the conclusion that everybody came to, whether they were British or Canadian or French or Nigerian or Ghanaian or Tunisian, um, was that the, the fallout was not harmful. Um, and this, this has to do with um, emerging <laughs> an extremely fragile consensus at the time that um, radiation exposure below a certain threshold was not harmful to human health. Um, you know, I'm not a scientist, I'm not, I'm not an expert. Um, I do think it's worth noting that the fallout levels that far from the site um, were, while detectable, um, lower, for example, than, than what the Marshall Islands um, experienced and what the Marshallese suffered. And I, 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 I struggle with that from, a, from an ethical and political standpoint, what that comparison means. Um, last thing I'll say is that your point about credibility and accuracy is spot on, it's crucial. And um, in the places where the um, European, North African, the European, North American and African experts were collaborating on fallout assessment, the question of race proved crucial for scientific credibility. And so did other factors, politics, um, institutional affiliations, et cetera. Um, and I, I have a dissertation chapter that tackles that problem. Thanks, uh, Austin. And maybe one more question from David Holloway. Um, and before we have to call it a day, uh, we still have a number of great questions here. I'll try to pass those along to you, Austin. Thanks, Alan. Um, so David Holloway asks, um, were there any opposition from French communists uh, or from scientists like uh, Frédéric Joliot-Curie um, uh, to the, the nuclear testing in Algeria, or were they hampered by the fact the Soviet Union was also testing in the atmosphere? Uh, hey, David. Great question. I have the um, uh, French um, Parti Socialiste papers and the PCF papers on my sort of like second tier research targets project. I don't know, um, but it's an interesting it's an interesting question. And as to your other question, um, I think that the 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 French minister um, uh, Jules Mock, the French delegate to the UN was um, not a communist, he was a, an avowedly anti-communist socialist. And the fact that he pointed to what the Soviet Union was doing in Kazakhstan, um, I, I think it was, I think it would complicate that kind of, that kind of politics for sure. Um, but uh, there are definitely some, some resonances to explore on the French left. Well, thank you very much, Austin, for a terrific presentation, a great Q&A session. Uh, I think uh, 
uh, many will agree that this was very, very interesting.